Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the poem Eden Rock by Charles Causley. So the poet himself comes from Cornwall and you can find in a number of his poems that he draws reference from his native landscape. Like many poets he sees uh, where he comes from as a real stimuli for him. His poems are famous for their simplicity and their very direct messages about life and love. He died on November the 4th, 2003, aged 86. So the poet is said when asked, you know, many times by very keen readers of his poetry, where on earth did you set Eden Rock? Where was it? Is it a real place? And he said, no, it's not a real place. And he has no idea, actually. He said probably somewhere in Dartmoor, which can be found in Cornwall. But the words Eden Rock form our title, and they seem deliberately vague, almost symbolically so. So there's a lot of mythology and definitely biblical um, imagery associated with Eden. For me, I associate it with pure utopian innocence, a place to be respected and hallowed. Now, whether we choose to see this Eden Rock as a mythical place or a place where the speaker's parents dwell or where he seeks to dwell, it is somewhere beyond. They are waiting for me somewhere beyond. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack, still two years old and trembling at his feet. My mother, 23, in a sprig dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. She pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way. Over the drifted stream, my father spins a stone along the water, leisurely. They beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call, see where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. Instantly we're struck by the uncomfortable nature of the use of they. It's the third personal plural of a pronoun and it adds distance between our speaker and his parents. And we're thinking, is this a geographical location difference? Is this different time periods, a generational divide? No matter which way we slice it, they versus me makes our speaker vulnerable. They seem quite left out. It's interesting to note that the beats per line are broadly in a pentameter, that means 10 beats. And though we might say, you know, it's interesting that it's so regular in this form across the whole poem. Line one is different. It has 13 beats and a colon at the end, which definitely builds our understanding that more details of this somewhere beyond are to be shared with us. It's as if there's more than a list, the details are now with us. And we're talked through some very graphic, it would seem, memories. But I'm interested, is this a description of the father as a real memory or is it a caricature of him? For instance, you know, genuine Irish tweed, those letters are capitalised for each of those words. Is there a hint of sarcasm here at his father's pride at wearing this tweed in his same suit? Is it brand loyalty and respect to such a uh, famous brand for the time period? Or is it just nostalgic cultural baggage? It's interesting that we get an echo in uh, stanzas one and three of same suit and same place, hinting at memory and the expected standard being bound, as if uniformity is somehow familiar and comfortable. Even if the reality of these memories is not clear to us, it's the imagination that goes alongside it that makes it seem safe to our speaker. It's interesting if we were to play around with this idea of is this really the father? We get a different impression of what our father is like when we then are interacting with the dog in line four. The dog is still two years old, this terrier Jack, and it implies that the dog is always remembered at that specific age. 
And it's interesting to note the verb trembling at his owner's feet. So at that point, we change our depiction of the father figure here. Instantly, we know in the first line that he's waiting for his son. But does the father bring out fear in some way? Is he quite a stern figure? He's portrayed in static terms, but the dog is trembling. He seems quite scary. It's interesting to note that the mother is portrayed in a much more dynamic, motion-filled way. The mother is portrayed as very pretty. She's in a sprig dress, so a dress that has actual flowers on it uh, and nature decorating it. But also it's drawn in at the waist. So for the time period that this is expected to be at, it would have been very fashionable for things to be drawn at the waist. She has a ribbon in her straw hat and the light, you know, is shining on her beautiful hair, the colour of wheat. We're expected to see this difference. The mother is also connected to real world objects as well. And it's interesting, we see her do something in line seven of the poem. She's spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. I think it's interesting that when we read that, there are three stress syllables that make the cloth seem even stiffer as we read it. She's doing something proactive though. And as we move on to stanza three, we really get a sense of the everyday nostalgia images that pepper our imagery. So from the thermos flask to the HP sauce bottle, we get a unique sense of how these parents are trying to make their picnic work. The HP sauce bottle should have had sauce in it, not milk. So we definitely get a sense that they're not particularly well off. But more than anything, the adverb slowly in line 11 shows the care and attention that the parents show and make do with the best that they can possibly manage in this time. The same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. I think that's another hint that things are not lavish. The tin cups have had to be painted to look more fashionable. So this whole set of stanzas one to three is very nostalgic and concentrates on objects in quite literal terms. There is a key change though, as soon as we open to stanza four, it opens with clearly metaphorical language. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. We know that there's an elevation into the symbolism of what we're reading from here. And the question that we have is what are these three suns? Is it the parents, the two of them, and the child? Is it a biblical allusion to the Holy Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Ghost? It's interesting if we were then fast forwarding on to the image of the drifted stream, we're presented with an image that brings us to other images of streams in literature. So there are two ways that literature often portrays a stream. Literally, it's a way to go somewhere on the water but it's often seen as a barrier between one place and another. So for example, in the ancient world, in ancient Greece, they believed um, in the river Styx, and it was a, a stream that, that ran between the earth and divided the earth from the underworld, and it was believed that all dead things lived in the underworld. So in some weird way, it is causally here questioning the challenge and the process of dying and the journey that we take it's interesting to see the two reactions of the parents here. They have very different approaches. The mother is looking at her child, willing him to come closer. The father, however, is spinning a stone across the water. He's not looking at the son. The most uncomfortable, interesting fact about line 16, a stone along the water, leisurely, Aside from the enjambement just finishing off the description of what the father is doing, that line only has four stressed syllables, not five as we might expect with the rest of the poem. It makes the adverb leisurely really drag out. And as we move to the next stanza, we really feel time slow down. This final stanza really emphasises the distance now. They beckon to me from the other bank. And we're thinking, how can he be reunited with these two? It's definitely clear from the encouragement that his parents give him. He is reluctant to cross, as they suggest. He doesn't want to follow their advice. 
And it's the chilling nature of that final line that does the real work for us. It's gripping. It's the use of the pluperfect tense. I had not thought that it would be like this. It's so cryptic. What does the speaker mean? Is this what it would be like to see your parents after such a big gap? Is this about dying and seeing heaven? Is it better or worse than he hoped for? All of these questions are left lingering for us as readers and there is no closure here. Physically in the layout of this poem in its graphology, there is an extra line break emphasising the distance between the speaker and his parents. And as if that weren't enough, across this poem littered throughout, there are half rhymes that could have been so much more slick. They've been intentionally kept there to heighten the not quite distance of it. Things like way, leisurely, bank, think, is, this, they don't feel comfortable to us. They're not meant to. As we walk away from this poem, there are haunting feelings left upon us. The parents were waiting at the start of the poem for their son to join them. And they're still waiting for our speaker. It's quite an odd picture of division between parent and child. And whether Causley is questioning life beyond, somewhere beyond, or parental love at its most intense, or a life that your parents had before you. There are so many questions, but there's definitely something in the imagery that's a look back to nostalgia and a question mark about what happens next in this life. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?